uh, we're, we're going to look at the purpose of the law um, and, and the Old Testament as kind of a whole. Um, so if you remember last week, we, we were finishing up chapter 8 of Hebrews, a uh, very important chapter, but it ended with, with, the ta- with the thing about the covenant being replaced. And so it said three different things about the covenant on that next uh, slide there, Chris. The covenant was first off, it was faulty. So from its get-go, it was faulty. From the very moment of its creation, it was faulty. The second thing um, is it is now it, it has now been made obsolete because of, of what Jesus did. He brought the new covenant. And then the third thing that it said back then, at the time that it was written, it said that it is about to pass away. It is passing away. So at this point, it seems like it has passed away is what it seems like. Um, it, during the time it was written, it was kind of in a transitional period. Um, I might be misunderstanding that, but that's as far as I understand it. So before we get to the questions, we have to answer this question, which I neglected to answer last week. What is the covenant? I keep talking about the covenant. What is it? Well, okay, so there's two things. First off, the covenant is the contract made between God and Israel. Um, this happened kind of in stages. Uh, it happened with it, the promise of it w- was all the way back from the Garden of Eden when God told Adam and Eve that the serpent and they would smash the head and all that. That was the, the start of it. But it, we didn't actually see things come out of that until more of Abraham com- came onto the scene and we got some more promises there. But then the actual official l- um, legal covenant was established with Moses and Israel at Mount Sinai. He made an agreement there. Um, so, so it's, it's something to, to keep in mind is that the, the law, the basis of the law is the covenant. And the basis of the covenant is the promise. Sometimes when we're reading the Old Testament, we lump it all together. It's the Old Te- Testament, or it's the law. But it's important to make this distinction. There's a promise. And then on the promise, the covenant was made on the promise. Think of it like a tower being built. And then on the covenant, the law was given. The law was given after the covenant had been established. It was part of the covenant, okay? The law was not the first thing that happened. It wasn't the last thing that happened, okay? So, uh, then the second part of the covenant is the new covenant, which is the covenant that we are under as Christians. This replaced the old covenant, um, and this is something that God has made between himself and his people, which would be Christians, We mentioned this last week. That does not mean that the nation, the ethnic nation of Israel is cast off, that God still has a plan for them. However, salvation is through the new covenant. So we kind of looked at that already. I don't really want to get too much into that. And um, this covenant was formed by Jesus' death. That brought us into the new covenant. So now now that we know what the covenant is, let's actually get to the discussion now. Why did God ever give the covenant... If it was faulty from the start, why did he give us the law and the covenant? If it was faulty from the moment of its conception, he gave us a faulty law. Why? Tracy, you got an idea? That's a good guess, but not quite. Anybody else? Why did God give us a faulty covenant? What's the point of that? Okay, so I'm not quite following. I I think you're on the right track, but I don't think I'm getting what you're trying to say. You're saying because God had a plan that he was going to send Jesus. How, help me understand what you're trying to say about how that ties in with him giving the faulty covenant. I think I get what you're saying, but I, I want to hear y- you. Yes, yeah, so I think you are right. I think you were starting off perfectly right, exactly where, on the direction we need to go. I'll, I'll repeat what she said, not just for the live stream, but just in case you guys over here didn't hear. Basically, because God knew that he was going to send Jesus, he gave something for that intermediate period to kind of, um, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, kind of like um, heading us in the right direction in looking for it, right? That's what you're saying? There was, yeah. There was going to be something that was going to happen, and so he gave 
that kind of like to is the in the in between period. Anybody else want to want to jump in here? Why did God give a faulty covenant? And you can build on what she just said, or come up with a different reason altogether. Did, did he need, you're, you're asking a question, did God need more people to form the covenant? Not that I can tell. Sorry? Not that I can tell. That's a, that's a, that's a good thought, but not, not that I can tell. I could be wrong, but I'm not, not sure I see that happening in the Bible. It's a good observation, though. I mean, I would have never thought of that. This is an important thing to think about, and, it, and, I'm, and this is why I'm giving you guys lots of time to think about this, because the Old Testament is a huge part of our Bible. <laughs> if we don't actually ever look at this question, it's going to be hard to, <laughs> to get God's Word in our life if we don't even get it, you know? Okay, so I'm going to start going forward. If you guys think of something, flag me down or something, all right? Because I don't want to... Don't want to waste too much time here, but I also want to give you plenty of time to think about this. So, um, my answer is partially borrowed from a book by Craig Blomberg. He's an excellent scholar. I um, want to recommend his book to you. Uh, specifically, in this case, I'm borrowing from a book called From Pentecost to Patmos. Um, it was a book I got in college. Um, you know those th those nerds in college that buy extra textbooks than the ones that are required because they really want to learn. That was me. <laughs> this was not a required textbook. I just bought it because I thought it might help me to get the class better. So anyways, uh, we're going to read a series of, of verses um, coming from Galatians. So go ahead and turn to Galatians, and, and we'll read it through. I brought my hard copy of the Bible just in case I need to look around while we're answering these questions. Galatians chapter 3. This is what it says. Now, it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. So the very first thing to mention from this is that the law didn't save anyone. People came to salvation before the law and before the covenant, and they came to salvation after the law and after that covenant. If salvation was dependent on the law, we would, first off, we'd still be under it, but then second off, people wouldn't have gotten saved before the law was given. So the very first thing before we get going, it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. How was Abraham saved? By faith. <laughs> Not by the law. He wasn't even under the law. So let's, let's keep that in mind. People got saved before the law by faith and God's promises. The, the, the way that people are saved is the exact same way. It has not changed. God gives promises. People believe in them and are saved. Do not believe in them and are not saved. Those are, that's the way it is. We just have a fuller revelation. And the promises that he gave... We're looking forward in large part to the first coming of Jesus. Not entirely, because there's also the second coming of Jesus. So not entirely, but in large part. So then we get hop down just a few verses to verse 17, the exact same chapter. This is going to give us uh, the next piece in the puzzle before we actually start answering the question, okay? If you go to the next slide there. Uh, oh, you already got that. Never mind. Uh, so verse 17 through 18 says, My point is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously established by God and thus cancel the promise. For if the inheritance is based on the law, it is no longer based on the promise. But God has graciously given it to Abraham through the promise. So a couple things here. First off, 
promises of God were not based on the law. The law was based on the promises. This is what I just said a minute ago. So, it, so this is the reason why the law can be set aside, because the law was not the basis of our salvation. God's promises were the basis of our salvation. So when the law was given, as like Darla said, an intermediate phase in our salvation, another step in the process, it could just as easily be set aside as well. Does that make sense? Kind of? Sort of? Any que- Let me just ask it differently. Any questions at this point? Okay, all right. So the next thing I want to point out from this the law was given to be temporary. If you go to that slide, oh, there, you're, you're, you are, no, you're great. You're, you're excellent. The law was given to be temporary. It was never given to be the end game. From its get-go, the moment that God gave it, it was given to be temporary. God knew what he was doing from the moment of creation, from before the moment of creation. And when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, which he knew they were going to do, it wasn't like he walked up and said, hey, why are you guys hiding from me? <laughs> he knew. <laughs> like, he knew. Uh, he, and then he makes a promise. He makes the promise about the, 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 about the snake and how they're going to crush the head of the snake. Well, Satan is the snake. So then you get later on, and Noah comes out of the, out of the ark, and what does it say about Noah? It says he's got three sons, and Noah is cursing one of his sons, the, the, well, his grandson, actually. And he says this. He says, the tent of the Lord will dwell with Shem. Now, do you want to take a wild guess which, which of the three sons Israel came from? It was Shem. And if you remember in the law, they built the tabernacle, and God's tent dwelled with Shem, just like he promised from Genesis. This is not a new, like, hey, just kidding. He, he, he got it from the get-go. There, was, there wasn't a moment where he's just like, I guess I need to have a plan B. So that, those are the two things there. So now that we've looked at that, let's look at verses 19 through 20, and now we can start answering the question that I asked. Why did God give a faulty covenant? So if you turn in your Bible's exact same chapter, we're still in chapter 3, but this, now we're in verse 19, and we're going to go through verse 20. Why then was the law given? Here we go. He's going to answer our question for us, guys. It was added for the sake of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come, Jesus. The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not just for one person alone, but God is one. So let's kind of clarify what's being said here because that's kind of a lot to take in. We are not going to do a real in-depth study of of, of Galatians, but I just want to break this down. So the first reason for the law, which is on the screen, the very first reason for the law is because sin existed? Well, not quite. See, a better translation is this. There's two words here, kerin and parabasis, okay? It should be translated this, in order to cause a conscious sin. The law was given to cause conscious sin. The law was given to make people sin. (laughs) Did did you hear that? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So let me explain that because it sounds a little bit confusing. It's like, hey, well, hold on. That's a little bit circuitous. You gave us a law so that we'd sin so that we'd need the law? Like, what? what? (laughs) Hold on, hold on. Two things. First off, that made it to where when, they, when people were sitting, they now knew what they were doing. Now they knew what they were doing. Okay? There was, they weren't like, oh, I, don't, I didn't know that was wrong. No, you know. And then the second thing is, it provoked some people into a greater sin. See, the knowledge of what's right and wrong actually provokes some people to sin more. It's like this. Haven't you guys ever had kids... And you always have that one kid that you say, now don't do that. And so now that's, now that's the standard of what I need to do. Mom and dad told me not to do it, so now I got to do it. I mean, <laughs> we've dealt with kids before, right? <laughs> this is how kids think. Well, surprise, surprise, that's exactly how we think sometimes. God tells us not to do it, and we think, well, yeah, but I mean, I'm above the law. Uh, <laughs> like, here's a great example. God tells us, hey, don't be unequally yoked. But you know how often I hear, I hear Christians say, but I love her. 
I'm going, she's going to turn to Jesus because I'm going to love her enough to turn to Jesus. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but then it doesn't work, you know, and of course it's not going to work. And even if it was going to work, God still told us not to be unequally yoked. But I'm above the law. <laughs> we just do that kind of stuff. So, okay, so as sin increases, here's the thing about sin, okay? As sin increases, so does the awareness of the need for a Savior. Okay? As sin increases our awareness that we, need a, that we need a Savior increases as well. Okay, so now we can go to, to go to the second thing. With the same chapter still, chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? So here's the big question, because I just said the law and the promises are separate things. The law was built on the promise. The promise was not built on the law. So does that mean then, is this what he's saying right here in verse 21, does that mean that the law is contrary to the promise, that they don't see eye to eye? And then he says this. He says, absolutely not. For if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. See, the law never gave freedom. It brought bondage. The law is not something that we read and we say, hooray, I'm free in Jesus Christ. No, it's something we read and say, I am bound to sin, see, it didn't give us a Savior. It pointed forward to the need of a Savior. The law can be summarized like this. Y'all are sinners. That's not good news. <laughs> That's why Jesus' coming was good news, because now there's a way out from the burden. So 22 says this, but the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power. So then we go down to verse 23. Before this faith came, we were, un we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ. So now we have the second reason we were given a faulty law, so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. And we'll stop there to go to the point number two, the second purpose of, the, of, the, uh, of give, being given the faulty law, to deter sin. So the reason one was to cause sin, reason two was to deter sin. There's numerous ways we could say this. It was our guide to instruct and protect us. It acted as our guardian until the Christ would come. Uh, another we could say, is, uh, uh, he, he mentions a couple different things with being in the school to being in prison. There's lots of different things that he compares us to. Here in chapter 3, there's three different things. But long story short, that time is over, is what he says here. We are no longer under a guardian. See, the law was given to be our guardian, but then he makes it very clear, we're not under the guardian anymore. We don't need that school teacher anymore. We've come to maturity. The maturity is being in Christ. See, this is the problem that people get when they read the Old Testament. They don't take this into account. And then because they say, okay, so the Old Testament is God's word, which it is. So I guess I just read it, and the parts that I understand, I'm going to apply those parts. But the parts that I don't, which is going to be the grand majority of them, I'm not going to apply that because I don't understand it. Well, that's not a very good system. <laughs> that's not a good system. And uh, we're actually going to look at this um, sometime in the future about how... Uh, actually, I think it's tonight. I've been writing so many different lessons. It could be tonight. Uh, let me get back to you on that. So anyways, I'll just put a pin in that. Um, so, okay. Th th that begs a very important question. If the law was given to deter us from sin, it was our guardian, but we're no longer under the guardian, that begs a question. So what value does it have for us today? Now, we're going to have to come back to this question, but I want you to just keep this in, in your head. So if it's no longer a guardian, if we're no longer under the guardian, what value does it have? Keep, keep that. We're going to come back to it. Okay, so the third reason for, for the law um, is not taken from this argument in Galatians. It's kind of taken from a couple different places, so I'll just kind of go through it. Uh, number three, so we could understand the need for a Savior... And so that we could understand, and we could understand the intent behind Jesus' actions. Imagine if Jesus would have come. Okay, Jesus comes, but there's no law. So then he says, "I've come to fulfill the law." And you're just like, "What does that mean?" But what, what does that mean? And then all these times that he references the law and says, "You've heard it say this, but I say this." There's nothing for him to reference because it doesn't exist. <laughs> 
See, the law had to exist for him to reference it. Jesus' coming only makes sense in the backdrop of the Old Testament and the law. If you remove that and you just throw it away, you don't get Jesus. You don't understand him. So the third reason, we, he, he gave us this faulty system so that we could understand the need for a Savior and the intent behind Jesus' actions. We understand his life. We understand his death. We understand our need for a Savior. Uh, we understand that there are, in fact, moral absolutes. This is something that the Old Testament law taught us. Uh, and it also teaches us that salvation is beyond our reach. All, incre- all extremely important things to learn. Which takes us, uh, so we understand. That's the summary there. So the fourth reason it was given. So he wouldn't have to wait to dwell with his people and show his goodness. God is a God who just, he just wants to bless He's chomping at the bit, if that helps you imagine it. He's not waiting to bring destruction. The Bible actually says that he draws no joy from guilty people getting what's coming to them. That brings him no joy. But it says over and over and over again about how much joy it gets when, when people are worshiping him and he's blessing them. and just all, it, it, The whole Bible's filled with that kind of stuff. I, I can't even give you a reference because it's all throughout the Bible. So God didn't want to wait until the time of the Savior. He wanted to bless now. He wanted to get involved in people's lives. Can you imagine how much harder it would have been with Israel, for instance, if they had to go and do all that stuff without having any guidance with them? That would have been difficult. Difficult. What they did was already difficult. So people didn't have to do life alone until Christ came. God was there. He came as a pillar. He came as a, as, as, as a fire and as a cloud. So, okay. And the, 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 fifth th- the fifth thing, the law revealed God to those who knew as well as those who had forgotten him because this is what what it was. In the beginning, everybody knew God. But it's been a long time since then. (laughs) So all these people, they kind of lost track, kind of got off track there. As you study history, you see the exact same method, not method, system develop in cultures all over the world. It starts out they have a supreme being, God. And then there's these other gods that eventually come into the picture. And then that supreme being God becomes a sky God. And then eventually, over the course of time, he becomes less and less important, and the other gods become more and more important. You see the exact same thing happen in religions all around the world. What am I getting at? Originally, people only served Yahweh. But it's been a long time since then. So people forgot that there was another God that they worshipped. He became the forgotten God. And so then we get all the way down to Acts when Paul's witnessing to people, and he, they actually have a temple just for the forgotten God. And little do they know that that was actually the original God. The one that they're forgetting is the one that they're supposed to be going to. And so he makes reference to this, and he calls them back to it. And uh, so a, lo- a lot of important stuff happening here. But the law had to be given in order to, to remind people of what they had lost. So then the next thing, which would be the sixth, the law is a moral guide. And this is going to be shown once again in Galatians chapter 5 through 6. We're not going to read the whole thing because that's going to be two chapters worth of reading. So we're going to do a lot of summar- summarizing, summarizing, okay? Uh, the law is a moral guide, but that doesn't mean that we adhere to the Old Testament law. Okay, just to kind of keep that in perspective. So let's go through these things. I'm going to list uh, A, B, C, D, E, five different things. Uh, they're all on the screen at the exact same thing. And they make up as a whole the law of Christ, okay? So or let's just go through this real quick. Chapter 5, verse 13 through 14 says this. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is filled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. That was from the Old Testament law, by the way. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Um, and then, so that so the first thing we see is the law of Christ, love. You go to the second thing. You keep going down to chapter 5, verse 16. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. And then go to verse 18. For you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, so let's keep going. So two things there. Love, uh, avoid fleshly desires. Go to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Are you seeing how he's drawing a contrast between the Old Testament law and the law of Christ? 
And you go down to the, was the fourth thing, I guess? So the third thing was lived by the Spirit. The fourth thing is in chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so you also won't be tempted. Now here in verse 2, carry one another's burdens. In this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians is basically a, 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 a treaty on our freedom. And it's written to people who are called Judaizers. Now, these are people who think that you have to do the law and faith to be saved. And Paul, throughout the whole book of Galatians, is refuting that. So here we get to the end of the book, and he's now drawing a contrast between the dead law and the new law, the law of Christ. So here we have uh, the last thing I want to mention, financial stewardship. And this is not an exhaustive list of the law of Christ. It's these types of things that are law of Christ, right? Like, here's a good example. Did you know that we have two or three different, I think it's two different lists of the kind of character traits to look for in a pastor? Did you know that neither of them are the same? They've got different things in the different lists. Do you know why? Because the lists are not exhaustive. There might be something else in the list that you need, or they might not measure up to every single one of those things can happen on either way. See, sometimes you're going to have somebody that meets a bunch of those requirements, but they fall short one or two places. That's okay. They're still qualified to be a pastor. The thing is, you need to be aware of the idea of the list. <laughs> Does that make sense? And, uh, and, and I'm making it real simple here. So how does that apply to the law of Christ? This is not an exhaustive list. There's other things too. And you're not going to get all this. Okay? But it's that kind of thing. Okay? That, that type of thing. So uh, it's kind of, uh, well, I guess that's as good as you can say it. These sorts of things are the law of Christ. So chapter 6, verses, we'll just read 7. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a person sows, he will also reap. That's financial stewardship. And that it gives us a kind of a list there. So we've looked at five, I'm sorry, six different uh, causes, reasons why the faulty law was given to us. And now we can go to the next part which we're going to kind of try and, 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 and put some pieces together quickly here. First off, and just go to that next slide, it's all there. Um, first off, the law was not complete. The law of the Old Testament was not complete. It does not address every issue there is to address. It does not address every issue there is to address. Where does the Bible say, you hear people say this, where does the Bible say that I can't do that? What, what does the Bible say about porn? Well, the word, that's not going to really appear in the, in the Bible. That's, that's more of a new invention, okay? It's going to say things like, hey, sexual immorality, but it's not going to use the exact word online content, like words, online content. It's not going to do that. Like, that didn't exist, okay? Um, we nowadays smoke a lot of weed, <laughs> a lot of weed, well, it, people didn't really smoke that much weed back then. So you really have a little bit of, it's not going to really talk about that. It's going to say about not being intoxicated. It's going to say that. But it's not going to say, oh, and cocaine and heroin. And it, it, you can't expect that from the Bible. It's just silly. It's just silly. So the law was not complete. It does not address every issue. Tell me, um, tell me can you find me a single verse in the Bible that talks about uh, female equality? No? How about uh, which way to vote? No? Uh, how about gun rights? No? Yeah, because the law is not complete. It's not a complete list of how you should feel about every single thing. Its point is to point you to Christ. And what people do is they read the law and they think it's something, this is how things should be. The law does not tell us how things should be. It just points to our lack and our need for a savior. For instance, the law allowed for slaves. Are we really going to make the argument that slavery is okay? <laughs> like, yes, there was a different mindset with slavery back then, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that it's okay. <laughs> you get what I'm getting at? And in fact, we get to the New Testament, and Paul advocates very strongly that a, a slave owner should let his slave go. He should let him free. There's a whole book about it. <laughs> so, I mean, it, absolutely, yes, the, the law did not... 
mention every single issue. And to say something along the lines of, so what does the Bible say about this hot topic? It misses the point entirely. You're missing the whole point of the law. So then the second thing, uh, it can't be used as a cheat sheet for a quick solution. What I mean by that is you're going to face a lot of problems in your life where you're going to say, I don't know how to do with this. You can't just, mm, let's just turn here. In the case of Chris losing her job, this is what she should do. It's, it's not going to say that, right? It's not going to say that. It's not a cheat sheet. Um, it, unfortunately, a lot of people who are looking for God's will, they kind of treat it like it is. They, on the 25th day, of the, uh, let's try again. You see, and that's not, that's not a good system for setting the, setting the word. That's, that, that misses the point entirely. So the third thing, it, the law doesn't say how things should be. The law can't fix every injustice anyways. I want you to think about this, okay? Would you say that America has a plethora of laws? We have laws for just about everything. Try opening a business. You get smacked in the face so hard. <laughs> There's so many different rules and regulations. If we could achieve perfection by there just simply being enough laws, I think America would be perfect by now, don't you? Laws don't make something moral. And the lack of, mo uh, lack of law doesn't make it moral either. You can legalize something that doesn't make it moral. And you can try and create as many laws as you want. That still doesn't make it moral. <laughs> you cannot, ins let me say it like this, you cannot force somebody to be moral by giving them more laws. I, I'm sick and tired of Danny's sins, so I'm going to make more laws. Well, if he's already a lawbreaker, then adding more laws wouldn't help him not be a lawbreaker, wouldn't it? Isn't that what James says? That if you sin in one thing of the law, you've sinned in the whole of the law? So adding more laws wouldn't have helped then, would it? So it's not a perfect utopian guide of how things should be. So that brings us to, now we can look at the actual important question here, and this is, I want everybody to try and answer this, okay? What purpose does the law serve today? Okay, I'm going to read you a verse. I'm going to summarize the verse, and then I want to hear you guys try and answer this question as best as you can. I, I, I really want to, even if you think your answer is wrong, I'm still interested in hearing it. What purpose does the law serve, serve today? Let's, I'll read 2 Timothy before we answer this, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 says this. Most of you are going to know this. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The entirety of the Bible is profitable. Okay, so, um, no, that's a rabbit trail. Let's not go to that. So let's just say this. The law is a part of our all-sufficient guide for faith and da daily living. So that the Bible entirely is then our all-sufficient guide for faith and daily living. So that, that doesn't mean it has every answer for every question. Uh, that doesn't mean it has everything that you need to know. Okay, it doesn't tell us what stars are. It doesn't tell us how the human body works. It doesn't tell us how to be a doctor. It doesn't tell us that stuff, right? But it is our all-sufficient guide for faith and for daily living. It also doesn't tell us everything there is to know, but it is a part of God's guidebook. So the Bible as a whole is God's guidebook, and the law is part of it. Just because it does not directly apply does not mean it is not God's word or that it should be cast aside. So now that I've said that, Let's open this up to discussion then. Where, oh, where did I put this? Oh my goodness, did I not make a slide that says, I did not put the question on a slide. Did I do that? That's just silly. Okay, so you're just going to have to, you're just going to have to visualize, pretend that it is up there, but it's not, okay? Don't go to the next slide, whatever you do. <laughs> the question is, so what purpose does the law serve today? Okay, so your answer to the question, hold on just a minute. Your answer to the question, what purpose do the, does the law serve today? It is a, it's a moral guide for our hearts. Is that, is that what, basically what you're saying? Okay, just want to make sure I got that. Any other ideas? Looks like you're about to say something. You're itching. Okay, so let me see if I can summarize. Let me see if I can summarize. There's a lot of good stuff there. <laughs> Let me summarize here. There's... Um, it was 
it, it, it is still beneficial for us today in that it helps us to know the right direction, generally speaking, keeps us on track. And then you also said something else. Um, oh, shoot. I can't remember what it was. Let me just say this. Can you just summarize everything that you said if in one sentence? What would you say? Or your main point? Okay, so the law still shows us what's right and wrong. Okay. Were you raising your hand? So it's a basic guideline of how to treat God and people. Okay. All right. Anything else? Guys, got anything else? Okay, I'm going to go through these, these next things relatively quickly. So if you think of anything, do something with your hand, something that I'll see. Um, uh, for this next section, I want to strongly recommend, well, I don't want to recommend because it's not, you're n- probably not going to get much out of the book like I did. But I'll just say that I got a lot of what I'm going to say to you. I was heavily influenced by a book by Sidney Gridanis. Um, it was called Preaching Christ in the Old Testament. Um, Honestly, you probably won't want to ever read it, but it had some very interesting stuff in it for me, <laughs> okay? So, uh, I don't, I don't want to plagiarize or anything. <clears throat> and in the book, he talks about the way that the Old Testament um, and the New Testament, to put it in my words, is oftentimes separated as unrelated. You know what I mean? I think sometimes we miss the connection of the two. So uh, the first reason, or the first purpose that the law serves is today. It is part of the Christian canon. Okay, it is part of it. The early church, they only had the Old Testament. The early church didn't have the letters of Paul. It didn't have the Gospels of Jesus. It didn't have the book of Revelation. What they had was the law and the prophets. That is was their Bible. It doesn't, it does not repeat everything in the, New, in the New Testament that was in the Old Testament. Okay? There's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament that is not repeated over again in the New Testament. And people ask questions a lot like this. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. Um, and the New Testament assumes that you have knowledge of the Old Testament. It references it, it guides on it, it builds on it. If you didn't read the Old Testament, you wouldn't get that. In fact, I will say this. You cannot understand the New Testament if you do not read the Old Testament. I don't think there's, there's anything else I could say that, that would summarize it like that. You can read the New Testament, you can get glimpses of what's being said, but you cannot understand it without knowing the, knowing the Old Testament. It's just impossible. And so it doesn't have to repeat everything in the New Testament that was in the Old Testament for it to still be applicable, okay? The Old Testament is still applicable. How many things did Jesus say about practicing homosexuality? Anybody. How many times did Jesus mention homosexuality? Take a guess, anybody. What? Five times, you think? Who else thinks... Did you give an answer? I didn't quite hear. You, you don't think so? So does, does some, do you guys think maybe Jesus said one thing about homosexuality? Maybe one? No. You guys are right. He did not say one single thing about homosexuality. Do you know why? Because <laughs> the Old Testament already did. <laughs> why would he have to repeat everything the Old Testament said? He also didn't say anything about the laws. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the sacrifices. He also didn't say anything about, you know, all the other things. He didn't say anything about it, you know, the, the not trimming the edges of your beard and stuff. He, he never said anything about that either. <laughs> he didn't repeat everything that was in the Old Testament. So that's the first, that's the first um, way that the law still applies to us today. It is part of the Christian canon. The second thing, 
the New Testament is the climax of God's salvation story, but the Old Testament tells the buildup. It's the Old Testament that tells us all those stories of God intervening. The New Testament doesn't tell us that. I mean, honestly, look at the New Testament. How many times does it tell all those times of people barely almost not making it, and then God comes in and swoops and changes the whole thing? Well, in terms of the Old Testament, we've got plethora of examples. I mean, they're everywhere. Examples in Judges, examples in Samuel, examples in Kings. You go through the whole thing. It's nothing but examples of God and his story of, of salvation. Well, you miss that in the New Testament. I'm not saying the New Testament isn't important, but I am saying the Old Testament is equally important. The third thing, the Old Testament teaches truth that the New Testament does not teach because they are meant to complement one another. Okay? So the Old Testament teaches that we have a mandate to care for the earth, for instance, in Genesis chapter 2, I think. Where in the New Testament does it say that? <laughs> There's a lot of things that the Old Testament, truth that the Old Testament teaches that the New Testament does not. Because the primary purpose of the New Testament is mostly Jesus. And how that applies to the church. But mostly Jesus. <laughs> like, that's the whole, whole idea there. We're, we've been doing Hebrews uh, every week here on Wednesday night for a while now. Can you imagine how difficult that book must be if you've never read the Old Testament? <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make sense one way or another. So anyways, uh, the next thing, and so this is before, um, Revela- books like Revelation in the, New- in the New Testament heavily depend on the Old Testament prophets. If you don't know them, you miss the, re- the references that are being made in Revelation. And that opens you up for some very strange doctrines, very strange doctrines. The Old Testament gives us our root you know what I mean? It gives us our root. The, fr- the New Testament might give us our fruit, but the Old Testament gives us our root. You can't have one without the other. They, they need each other. And it's very important there. Um, Revelation is all... Honestly, I don't know... I could be wrong, but I, I think every single chapter from Revelation references the Old Testament prophets somewhere or somehow. But a lot of times people read Revelation with zero connection to the New Testament. So the next thing, number five, I think. The Old Testament is not in opposition to the New, T- New Testament. Okay, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is a side note. Sorry, this is not number five. This is just a side note. The Old Testament is not in opposition to the New Testament. It's not which one is better. Okay, we're not talking about which parent we want to get stuck with in the divorce. That's not what we're talking about, okay? Um, it is a united whole. All right, so as I'm going through these things, I'm not trying to make the New Testament look bad. Um, But in my opinion, the Old Testament is kind of given a bad rap, and I don't think it's fair. Uh, So um, the fifth thing, the Old Testament gives us the worldview necessary to understand the New Testament. Okay, Here in America, we have a different worldview than Paul did. We have, morally, it's a different culture. We have the whole, here's a great example, we have the whole America thing going on here, you know, the freedom of speech and, you know, voting for the people that we want. Paul didn't have that. (laughs) I mean, you had somewhat, somewhat rights as a Roman citizen, but who voted on the emperor? <laughs> oh, not me. <laughs> oh, hey, that's my neighbor uh, burning to death on that stake over there. I didn't vote for this. <laughs> well, welcome to the world. <laughs> Here in America, things are a lot different. Our worldview is different, very much so different. Uh, we look back on a longer history of post-Christianism than Paul did, obviously. So we see, for instance, the, the Middle Ages and the terrible things that happened there and the things that people called themselves Christians, but they were not acting like Christians. And then they went to, went to war in Jerusalem and that whole mess, and there's still a taint on Christianity thousand years later. It would kind of left a bad taste in people's mouth. You know, the whole killing Muslim things, that, that wasn't a real good idea. <laughs> that, wasn't a, that wasn't a Bible-inspired idea. That was a fear-inspired idea. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Paul, I can just imagine Peter as he's hanging, hanging upside down on a cross. Yeah, you should probably kill the Muslims unless they, unless, so that way they won't take over the world, you know. I don't think you can see Peter doing that at all. <laughs> I, I, I don't think you can see any of the founding fathers doing that. But anyways, 
um, founding fathers of the church, I mean. So the, so the, the Old Testament gives us the worldview necessary. Uh, we have our mixed backgrounds of Muslim and, and, and New Age and all these different things, and we need an Old Testament worldview. And that's the right way to come to the New Testament. For instance, a lot of times people go to the New Testament nowadays and they say, look, right there, it teaches reincarnation. Because they don't have the background of the Old Testament. They come to it with the background of New Age and Hinduism. So the, you need the Old Testament to get that worldview. The next thing, which I think is maybe six, the Old Testament explains the New Testament. Do you know how many times the New Testament says things that are just straight up confusing? If you Pretend you don't know the Old Testament. It's talking about Jesus being a sacrifice, and you're like, what? What does that mean? I mean, if that, pretend like you don't know anything about the law, and you're left with this, and you're just like, what? That's a creepy thing to say. What about sin? A lot of times the New Testament will say things about sin that we don't quite grasp unless we have a root of the Old Testament. I mean, you don't have to have the whole thing memorized, but you do have to have a basic idea there. The next thing, which might be seven, I kind of lost track. The Old Testament prevents misunderstanding of New Testament teaching. Here's a great example. Um, oh, yeah, here's a great example. Um, the Bible talks about the kingdom of heaven in the New Testament. Pretend like you don't know anything about, about the Old Testament, and you might come to this kind of a conclusion. We are talking about a heavenly kingdom where I can escape from the physical sinful world. But that's actually a Gnostic teaching. That's not a Christian teaching. The Christian teaching of the kingdom of heaven is as heaven and earth. How do you know that? The Old Testament. If you don't come to the New Testament about the Old Testament, then you're going to think that the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual thing, that everything physical is sinful, everything spiritual is holy. That's exactly what the people in the Corinthian church were thinking too. It's called asceticism. Everything spiritual makes me more spiritual than you, so if I just separate myself, I'm all good. See? And everything physical has to be a sin then. Well, you can read through 1 Corinthians all by yourself, but that, that's a huge misunderstanding. Um, the physical is not inherently sinful. God's kingdom includes earth. Jesus came in the flesh, and if everything fleshly was sinful, then Jesus was sinful. Think about this. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? As, some, as this Gnostic teaching somehow got into Christianity, and it still continues today. I think his name was Marcion that, that got that, that one going. But anyways... It, it has no place in the Christian church today. The physical world is not inherently sinful. Um, it's sin <laughs> that is sinful. Um, and he says in, in the Bible, and a lot of translations even still follow this, my kingdom is not from this world. A better understanding is my kingdom is not of. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. Your translation is going to say my kingdom is not of this world. The correct translation is not from this world. In other words, it's a heavenly kingdom that is being inserted into the, heaven, into the earthly. When Jesus reigns, he's going to reign in heaven and on earth. Both. It's not, he's not secluded to the spiritual because of the sinful flesh. That's not how that works at all. Um, which, a side note, just stick this in your back pocket for a rainy day. To be sinful is not a requirement of being human. Remember that, okay? Because Adam and Eve in the garden, no sin, okay? Just remember that for a rainy day. So New Testament, I mean, sorry, Second Timothy 3, chapter, uh, verse 14 and 15, the, right before the part that everybody knows, this is the part that everybody ignores. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, you know those who taught you. What has he learned? What was handed down from his Jewish ancestors, it was the Old Testament that was handed down to Timothy. It was the Old Testament that he was supposed to keep firm. And the New Testament just concluded the thought. And um, you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, that would be the Old Testament right there, um, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Old Testament is able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Old Testament gives you the wisdom for it. See that? New Testament is scripture too, but at this point, there was no New Testament for him to turn to. <laughs> he, he was raised because let's say he was 20. This was probably written in like the 60s. So we're talking about the 40s, so there would have been no single New Testament document written at that point. 
So if he was raised with it, it would have only, historically speaking, have been the Old Testament. So let's plow ahead and kind of wrap up some ideas here. The last thing, the Old Testament gives a fuller understanding of Christ than the New Testament on its own does. The New Testament simply highlights key parts, but it's the Old Testament who gives us the accurate image of the Christ. The New Testament just says, look, here he is, he fulfilled it. And then it references back to the Old Testament. But it's the Old Testament that says, this is, this is the Christ. Isaiah tells us about the suffering servant. Psalm tells us about the, the, the majesty on high that, that, that sat at God's right hand while God did his work, right? That's Psalms that tells us that. You get to the prophets and it tells us about the coming day of the Lord where, where the Messiah is going to reign and all these different things are going to happen. Ezekiel tells us about how with the coming of, of the Messiah, God's presence is going to return. Uh, Amos tells us about how in, in the day of the Lord that God's people are going to have a land that they're never kicked out of again. It's the Old Testament that says these things, not the New Testament. It just makes reference to it. So, there is no doubt that somewhere, someone, and we've got to wrap things up kind of quickly because it's getting late. Somebody somewhere is no doubt thinking in the back of their mind, and I even have a slide for this because I know somebody's thinking this somewhere. What about Matthew 5.17? Well, what about it? Let's turn there. <laughs> Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. Well, now hold on here. This is a little wrinkle in the page now, isn't it? And then he goes on to say, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and, does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I, t- excuse me. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. But it was impossible for your righteousness to get to surpass theirs in the law. The only way that your righteousness could have surpassed them is by your faith in Christ. Which brings us to the conclusion of this little little conundrum. And unto this I owe in large part to Duvall and Hayes' Grasping God's Word, 3rd edition. Check it out. Probably one of my favorite books. There are a couple of different parts of this answer. The first part of this answer. First, it does not mean that the Old Testament law and the Old Testament and the Old Testament law are eternally bi- binding. That's not what he's saying. Because if this is what this is how people interpret this all the time. Don't think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill the law is always in effect. It's never not going to apply to me. But that's not that's not what he's saying. If he was saying that, here's the problem that you're going to face, that would mean that the sacrifices are still in effect. Because it's part of the law. You cannot separate the sacrifices from the law. So if he's not saying that, then what is he saying? Well, this is the second part of this. He didn't come to write them off. Jesus did not come down to earth just so that he could take the law and say, whoosh. Like on the movies, you know, and sweep it all off the counter. You, you know what I'm with the with like they'll have all the glasses there. Whoosh! He didn't come for that purpose. That's not why he came. Rather, he came with the intent of bringing about their intended conclusion. And as Paul told us in Colossians, they are concluded. And that was his purpose to come and fulfill the law. See, Jesus came as a Jew, he lived as a Jew, he was under the law, he fulfilled the law. And in fulfilling it, he set us free from it. There had to be the fulfillment. And that's what he's saying here. I didn't come to just ignore it and pretend like it didn't exist. I came to live as a Jew to fulfill the law of the Jews. So, he then, he then goes on to change from, from this part right here. If you keep reading chapter 5, This is your homework for the week. Keep reading chapter 5. Jesus is going to go and change the law. Right after he said, I did not come to abolish but to fulfill, and then he's going to change it. There are some things he's going to say that he's going to make it more severe than it was before. You've said in the law not to do this, but now I have something even harder for you to add to that. You can't even do it with your heart. You can't even do it in your heart with your eyes then there's some parts of the law that he's just going to pretty much write off. Completely just ignore it. Read through Matthew 5 with an, and once again, pretend like you're a Jew 
The law is all you care about, and then read Matthew 5 through 7, and you're going to be surprised at the different things that Jesus says and how it relates to Old Testament law. I don't want to rip off that, um, that very, very impactful situation, so I'm not going to answer those questions for you, but I strongly encourage you to read those chapters yourself and see, and see for yourself how that plays out. So anyways, moving on. Um, so Jesus' main point from Matthew 5.17 not that it's binding, but he fulfilled it. So then, and here, here's what we can take away from Matthew 5.17 for us today. We have to reinterpret the Old Testament. Okay, so now let's wrap things, wrap, things, wrap things up. The biggest problem that people have with the Old Testament is twofold. I have it on the screen right here. Hold on. Ha <laughs> ha, see, we almost got it. Uh, twofold. Number one where people pick it apart. They pick parts from the Old Testament law and try to fulfill those parts, but they don't try to fulfill the whole thing because they're not in their backyard butchering a cow, right? <laughs> they're not, they don't have a priesthood with a tabernacle on it. They don't try to do that. <laughs> but they try to take certain parts out. Um, like, for instance, don't get tattoos, but it's okay if you trim the edges of your beard, right? So we're going to pick and choose which parts. And even a lot of people in the Assemblies of God do this where they'll say, okay, there's basically three types of laws. There's moral, civil, and ritual. Ritual doesn't apply to as moral does, and civil usually doesn't. Well, the problem with that is you're just picking it apart. The second common problem with the, with the law, the biggest problems today with the law, is blindly applying it. This is where you read it and you don't think at all about what's changed. You don't think about the New Testament or who you are in Christ. You just read it and then try to instantly apply it to your situation. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. Number one, we're not under the Old Testament, Old Covenant. Number two, we aren't Jews. Those right there is going to give you a two huge problems with, with just reading the Old Testament and applying it. Does it still apply? Yes, but you have to reinterpret it in our context. Our context is one after Christ came. Their context was one before Christ came. We do not have an ethnic covenant. They did have an ethnic covenant. We don't have a nation on earth that we're safe in. Right? Where God's going to bless and, and over... They did. They did. And so when they didn't pay their tithes, their crops wouldn't come in. When we don't pay our tithes, God just brings guilt to our conscience until we finally cave in and let, us, let him have our money. <laughs> it's a whole different context nowadays than it was back then. So we cannot simply read it and apply it. We have to read it, understand it, then apply it. Because it no longer, and hear what I'm saying, the Old Testament no longer directly applies to us. It applies to us through the context of Jesus coming. If you're not interpreting the Old Testament in light of Jesus, you're doing it wrong. Look at every single time people in the New Testament were, were preaching to people using the Old Testament. They brought Jesus into the equation. The guy is writing, a, a eunuch is writing in, a, in, his, in his chariot, and he's reading about this. How, what does this have anything to do with me? And it says that the, that the disciple comes with him and says, hey, I can explain that if you want. He says, okay, yeah, do that. And so he explains it to him and he says, ah, the Christ, what's stopping me from getting baptized right here, right now? See, it was in light of Jesus. Every time the Old Testament is brought up in the New Testament, it's in light of Jesus. Every time. If we are reading the Old Testament without taking Christ into the equation, we're doing it wrong because the Old Testament no longer directly applies to us today. We aren't Jews living 2,000 years ago in the promised land. That's not us. <laughs> okay, so we just keep that in mind. Um, what does the Old Testament have for us today? Much if we study. Almost nothing if we don't. The Old, Tes the, the Old Testament has almost nothing for you if you don't study. You, you're, you're never going to... If you, if you just try and pretend like, oh, it's there, whatever. It doesn't have much for you. But if you study it, it has great riches for you. So does Israel's return to the land in, 19, in the 1940s and the continuation of Judaism as a, as a religion, does that invalidate the things that we've been reading in the book of Hebrews? Nope. It affirms God's faithfulness to the people of Israel, and it means that they are using an expired textbook. <laughs> That's all it means. It, it does not invalidate the things that we're reading through Hebrews. So as we go, get back to Hebrews next week, and we start looking at that, the situation right now in the Middle East does not invalidate any of the things that Hebrews is saying. does not invalidate any of it. God's goodness just has a way of making up for our lack. So uh, now that we've said all that and I went way over, I'm super sorry. Are there any questions? <laughs>
Okay, if you get stuck in the Old Testament, you, there's a passage you just don't see what's going on. Question box. Don't forget the question box, guys. Literally, any time you get stuck, we can work on it together. If I, don't, if I don't know the answer, I'll research the answer. I know a bunch of people way smarter than me. I can ask them for their input, too. Um, you go ahead. I didn't hear what? I actually have someone I'm going to ask to work on it. But as much as I enjoy that question, we can talk about that later. I meant, is there any question about the law? <laughs> Now, this was a very difficult lesson, guys. So if, if, if there was just too much going on, think about it for a little bit. We have it online. Go back and watch parts that you found confusing. Maybe if there's certain parts, you can always write it down and just say, hey, look, you said this. Can you explain a little bit more? I'm not getting it. There's zero problem with asking questions. There are no stupid questions. The only stupid question is the one that's not asked. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, help us to always treasure um, just how much, well, treasure you've given us um, in, in your word and how it, how it is such a, such a valuable asset to our lives and how it is profitable for us to, to be corrected and, and rebuked and encouraged um, that we would look to it and, and seek you, Lord, in all things. And, uh, Lord, as, as we're reading the Old Testament, help us not to leave it then and there for the Jews. Help us to read it here and now in light of Christ. Help us to go to it and read it and take it over into the now under the law of Christ and not under the law of Moses. That we would, uh, that we would seek you in all things and we would find you in all things, Lord. We love you. Amen.